So I'm Haley Sater. Um, I'm the county agent um, down in Wicomico, so I'm located in Salisbury. And um, I'm going to be talking about blueberries and blackberries today, um, uh, mostly because I have a background um, in blueberry breeding, but I'm also really interested in other small fruits, and I think blackberries have a pretty um, good potential um, for increased acreage um, on the shore, but also other parts of Maryland. Um, I haven't been here at this meeting ever before because I was hired in 2020. I don't think it's ever happened, but how many of you are from um, the shore versus um, the other side of Maryland? Yeah. Western. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Uh, Western? Raise your hands. Where? Is it about? Okay. And mostly shore. The rest of you are shore. Okay. Because a lot of this is, is for the shore, but um, I'll include other parts of Maryland as I speak too. Um, so why would we grow um, berries and um, specifically blueberries and blackberries? Well, um, they're a high value um, crop. So if you have limited acreage um, or um, you want to be able to sell something directly, you have an on-farm market, um, they can be highly profitable. Um, but also in terms of consumer trends, berries, uh, Americans are eating about twice as many berries as they were in the year 2000. Um, at least they doubled that consumption um, in 2020, uh, not 2020, 2015. Um, so, and then the other reason I think that a lot of these new blueberries and blackberries um, are exciting is because we have some really improved genetics um, and some better cultivars um, than we've had in the past. So increased storage um, life, um, better flavor, better texture, um, especially um, among blackberries, which just um, haven't traditionally had a very long shelf life. Um, one thing about both of these crops that I think is interesting is that they are both actually um, native to the mid-Atlantic. So you can find blackberries growing in ditches, probably in places on your property where you don't want them growing. Um, and then uh, blueberries, you're not going to see so much here on the shore, um, but uh, they were domesticated in New Jersey only about um, 100 years ago. So they're a fairly recent crop. Um, so I'm going to first kind of talk about soil and why that's really important for berries. Um, I think it's especially important for blueberries because um, when something is going wrong with the root system, it can be kind of hard to figure out, but it's also really hard to fix um, once that plant is already in the ground. Um, so here um, on the shore, we have mostly sandy soils, um, which can be great for vegetable production. It can work well too for berry production, but then you get to the other side of the state um, and you have completely different types of soils. And I'm kind of generalizing them here um, as clay and rocky soils, but um, you may be working with a completely different production system if you're in Washington County um, than we're going to be looking at here on the flat shore with our sandy soils. Um, and so I've, I've kind of already talked about this, but the reason your soil type is so important and something you want to consider before planting is because it's going to affect how, how your drainage is going to work, um, the electrical conductivity and kind of the buffer capacity of that soil. Um, as well as nutrient availability um, and then how the roots are actually going to grow. So blueberries are kind of notorious for having weak root systems. And if you plant a blueberry that's in, um, you know, a really fine textured, um, easy to grow in media like peat moss into a clay soil, it is just not going to grow. It'll keep growing around and around um, in that original media that it was started in, um, and it's just not going to penetrate that clay very well. Um, and then also soil is going to affect, your soil texture and type is going to affect what types of pathogens and problems you have in, in it. Um, so hopefully if you're growing blueberries, you already know um, that you should have really high organic matter in your soils. And around here, or at least where I'm at in Salisbury, I've never seen a soil report that has 3% um, organic matter unless it is in a blueberry planting where they've done a lot of amendments. Um, so we just don't have soils with natively that high um, organic matter. And 
where blueberries evolved, you know, in these peat bogs um, in places like New Jersey, they, they do have um, this high organic matter soil. So we basically have to give that to the plant um, if you want them to do well. So, um, and then ideally you want them to have good drainage. So um, in that way on the shore, um, it can be a good thing to have sandy loam soils. You're just going to have to amend them um, with something to add that organic matter they're missing. So for us, um, low organic matter, but sandy soil. If you're on the other side of the state and you have heavier texture soils, um, they're probably going to hold too much um, water. So you're going to see, even here, when I look at a field, you see a low spot. Um, if there's going to be moisture sitting in that area of the field, you're going to have problems there with blueberries. They just, they don't have great root systems and they don't tolerate wet feet um, well at all. And so if you're, um, if you're in a clayer, heavier texture soil area of the state, um, the best option for you is to make raised beds um, to help that so, uh, to help drain the soil um, of excess water, you know, gravitationally, the same as you would with vegetable beds. And we can do that here on the, on the shore too. It doesn't hurt to do a raised bed system. Um, Ideal pH range for blueberries is going to be um, between 4.5 and 5.2. Once you start straying um, above 5.2, you're going to start having problems with blueberries being able to excess um, things like iron. Um, and when you get below 4.5, you're going to have trouble with things like aluminum toxicity. Um, and the types of amendments you want to use um, specifically for blueberry plantings are going to be um, basically anything pine. Um, if you can use pine needles, pine fine, pine bark, um, those are great. Blueberries love that. That's what they evolved in. Um, and then peat moss is also, um, that's a good media, I think, especially if you're going to grow in containers or if you're trying to propagate um, new cuttings. But um, it's too expensive to, to really put into um, you know, an acre of blueberries. So I wouldn't recommend it there. Um, and if you're trying to lower your soil's pH, because hopefully you've already done a soil test if you know you're going to plant blueberries um, in a new area, and um, say that soil pH is at 6, you're going to need to bring it down. Um, pine bark is not going to be enough to bring that down quickly, so you're going to want to apply sulfur. And um, conveniently, um, I use... Uh, this table, I think there are some others that exist, but um, this is from University of Michigan, and it gives you an idea um, how many pounds per acre of sulfur you need to add, um, depending on your soil texture and um, what pH you're already at. Um, so if you're going to be if you're going to be lowering that soil's pH, you need to do it in advance. So you're not going to um, be spreading the sulfur, incorporating it, and then planting a week later. You need to give it time for the bacteria in the soil to break that sulfur down and turn it into the acid that's going to lower the soil's pH. It's not, um, it's not a chemical reaction. It, it's microbes that are breaking the sulfur down. Um, and Chris knows about this because um, he helped me uh, bring the soil pH down. Um, here at the Y, and I couldn't find any sulfur pellets when I wanted to plant blueberries. So um, I got the powder. Um, it's bright yellow. Um, and I would totally recommend using the pellets if you can find them, because it gets everywhere, and you're going to smell like sulfur. And you should probably throw those clothes away, no matter what you wear. Um, uh, well, and real quick, we did find a, a powdered sulfur that's not like the yellow jacket. Yeah. The yellow jacket's about 90% sulfur by volume, but yeah. we found uh, like the like, like dispersed or whatever. Like uh, the yeah, and it's more like a sand, if that makes sense. And it's 80% mm -hmm. by volume. And we've used it in the high tunnels and stuff like that in a little green Scott's push spreader, you know, and it got good results. So yeah. the pellets are, are great. If you want to go with those, great. But, you know, there are other options within the powder. You don't, you know, have to be as nervous. But it does get up in the wind, and it will get all over you. I highly yep. suggest a Tyvek suit with a yep. lid on it. So, sorry to I still have clothes that smell like sulfur. And they call me the sulfur queen at yeah. Lesrec. So, um yeah, so it's memorable, but I don't know, when we were, 
we were doing this in 2021. I couldn't find the pellets anywhere, and so we just went with the powder. Um, but we did that in the spring, um, gave it all summer for the soil pH to kind of get low. Um, and then by the time we planted, it had dropped, I think, a point or something like that. I can't remember off the top of my head. They kind of, especially our, our water here is, you know, high hydrocarbonate water, so it kind of brings our pH up on its own. But, but it usually runs around 6 where we're not irrigating. And, and we brought it down to 4-5 real fast. But yeah. I think we actually might have put the sulfur down in the fall of that year. Uh, maybe maybe it was October, late September, because I had started I in the spring. spring. I started in the spring that year, and I don't remember doing it, because uh, I started in May of 21, and we hadn't done it yet. So, But the results were really fast, maybe even too good, because I think the plot when we checked it was 4.1, and we had to put just a little bit of lime. I think we did 120 yeah. pounds of the acre. It's, it's a game. It's a game. You're trying to predict based on your soil texture and your cation capacity how much to put down and we wanted to be able to plant those, plant the plants in the fall because I know I put them in the ground in 2021. Yeah. But um, if you're spreading the sulfur in the fall too, that does not mean you should be planting in the spring because the microbes that need to be active to digest the sulfur they're going to be active when the soil temperature is above 55 degrees. So just note that. There's a lot of prep work for blueberries. Um, so around here, I would definitely recommend using drip irrigation. I've seen plantings with and without it. Um, but you know, during fruiting, um, it, we have hot weather, and um, you can have a dry spell, and that can really affect your yield. So I would definitely say um, if you're putting in a new planting, use drip irrigation. There's no reason around here that you should be using overhead irrigation. They do that in the south um, where uh, basically where they're planting varieties that are really early um, and they want to freeze protect um, those buds. Uh, you know, so if you're planting some of those um, southern high bush varieties days like today and um, weather like this can get them to come out of dormancy um, and then you'll lose all your buds. But hopefully you're not planting southern high bush varieties or all southern high bush varieties. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a second here. Um, ideally, we just talked about um, your water's pH, but um, it should be around 5.5. Um, if, you, if you're finding that year after year, say your well water has a pH of 8 and a lot of bicarbonates um, and it keeps raising that soil pH, what you can do is add acid um, to your irrigation water. And that's what they do in lots of the country. Um, so you would use um, sulfuric acid and have that injected into the drip line um, during irrigation. So as far as nutrient management, um, Um, but they like, uh, it, I've seen a lot of plantings, at least around here, where they're using wood chips as um, a weed barrier, but they're not using pine, they're using um, maybe the scraps from tree cutting crews. Um, and I, I just caution, if you're using um, mulches every year and you're planting that aren't, um, aren't pine, uh, they're going to probably be tying up a lot more nitrogen. Um, pine bark doesn't tie up as much nitrogen um, as, as other types of hardwoods do. Um, and then they could potentially be affecting um, the pH of, of the, the microenvironment around the roots, too. Um, so as far as your nitrogen sources, um, uh, anybody who's grown blueberries a long time hopefully knows this, but these are kind of the rules of thumb. If your pH is below 5, you can use urea as your nitrogen source. If your pH is above 5, then you want to use ammonium sulfate to bring that pH down. Um, what you should never use is nitrate, um, and that's because blueberries lack, um, or they have a very limited amount of the enzyme that would, um, uh, catalyzes the reaction um, to bring nitrate um, into, into ammonia. So, um, 
They, they evolved in these high pH or these low pH soils, so they really didn't need that enzyme. And what happens if you feed it to blueberries is it kind of kills the roots over time. So at the very least, they wouldn't be taking it up. At the worst, you'd be killing the roots. So it just, it's just not end efficiency. It's, there's actually a, a negative effect beyond end efficiency? Yeah, okay. yeah. At least in, a green, in, in the greenhouse studies. Hmm. But I was just informed that your mic died. Oh. Okay. Talking to the mic. Okay. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. I'll talk in the microphone. I just, I'm going to try and read these slides too. Um, so, as far as your nitrogen rates, um, you're going to start out with a pretty low rate in that first year, um, about 20 pounds per acre, and then step it up by 10 pounds um, every year until basically you get to full maturity, and that's going to be somewhere between 60 and 70 pounds per acre. Um, if you are fertigating, you can do this um, throughout the season, but if you're applying this um, directly um, to the plants or banding it in, um, make it two splits, do one at flowering, and then do the next one six weeks later during fruit development. Um, as far as um, being able to spot nitrogen issues in the field, um, nitrogen deficiency looks really similar to um, iron deficiency, and blueberries have a lot of problems with iron deficiency when your pH starts to get too high. And the giveaway um, to tell whether or not you have one versus the other is nitrogen um, is mobile, and you'll start to see that deficiency throughout the whole plant in younger and older leaves, whereas iron deficiency you're only going to see in younger leaves because it's an immobile um, nutrient within the plant. So. That's kind of the giveaway as to what problem you're experiencing. Is there a problem using uh, iron sulfate? I mean, um, it, you know, I mean, is that a... No, I don't, I don't think so. I used to work with rhododendrons a lot. Yeah. Kind of thing. But, um, you know, you can bring, up, bring down your pH, but it's also giving it... Giving it a shot of iron. Shot of iron. Yeah. No, that seems like it would be a good way, other than, yeah, like ammonium sulfate, because you're giving the nutrient that they need. Um, yeah. I, I don't know off the top of my head, though. I was, thinking, I was equating with other ericaceous plants. Like yeah. Rhododendron. No, it would make sense if you're seeing that iron deficiency. Um, potassium, I, I think in most plants, potassium is pretty easy to recognize. It's got that um, kind of reddish brown color, and it's always going to start on the tips of the leaves. Um, and these are, these are the levels that you should be um, looking for. What I recommend with all of uh, any high-value fruit crop like this is take leaf samples in the summer, Go, ha go send them off to a place like AgriLabs that's going to tissue test them um, and let you know if you have any deficiencies. Um, phosphorus, um, at least here on the shore, I don't think anybody is going to have phosphorus deficiency problems. Um, we have so much chicken litter um, that's been spread um, around here, or at least where I'm at in Salisbury. But um, if you're in another part of the state, these are the phosphorus um, amounts you should be looking for in, in your plants um, when you get them tissue tested. Um, and then if you were to see a deficiency, it's kind of a bronzing of the leaves um, and kind of a little less pronounced than potassium deficiency. Um, as far as pests and diseases, there are so many that I don't want to talk about all of them. Um, and what happens a lot of times when I get called out to go look at blueberries is it's not just one problem. It'll be, okay, I see, I see red ring spot virus here, and you've got some twig dieback, and maybe some leaf spot, and is there a nutrient deficiency going on? Um, so whenever I see something, and I think it's more than one issue, um, I like to submit a sample to the plant diagnostic lab um, that Dr. Karen Rain runs up um, on College Park campus. And that's because, especially uh, working for a university, you want to get the answer right and you want to be exact and know what's going on. Um, sometimes it may take her a week or, or so to process your sample, but you can always give her a call or email her um, to see, you know, um, 
what's going on, or if you think you have a specific problem, um, usually they have an idea when the sample comes in. They just can't confirm it until they um, plate out that pathogen and then, you know, properly diagnose it. Um, one of my favorite tools when I'm in the field is this um, pocket IPM guide, which you can download on your phone and then you have it with you all the time. This is produced by the University of Michigan. Um, I know I have it on my phone, but I still like to have it in a binder because the pictures are really big and they're super helpful. Um, so you can pretty much, you can see almost all of the pests and problems that we're going to have here. Um, they have similar problems in Michigan. I mean, we, we get some more southern type problems, but they talk about them here in this um, guidebook too. So I don't know. This is my favorite uh, book to take out when I'm looking at different samples. Um, and then in terms of a spray schedule, um, I like to use um, the one that's put out every year by Rutgers. Um, New Jersey has a lot of blueberry acreage, so they do a pretty good job of um, keeping this up to date. And what I really like about this bulletin of IPM um, is they have these um, kind of scouting guides along with what uh, chemicals you should be spraying um, at different times. This kind of just helps me visualize where, where we're at in the season. So they have one of these. Um, this is the... This is the disease page. They have one for insect management and then also one for um, herbicides. And I would say that um, this is something I've seen. So uh, know your herbicides and know how you want to be applying them um, in, in a berry patch. Uh, I would like to think that everybody knows, you know, um, something like Roundup is going to damage your plants, but um, you still see a lot of herbicide injury, or at least I've seen a lot of herbicide injury um, in small fruit planting. So um, be aware of this and know, make sure that whoever is applying your chemicals, you know, knows whether or not it's a selective herbicide um, and is spraying accordingly. Um, in terms of perennial weeds, these are going to be kind of your biggest challenge for something like blueberries. Um, if you're planting into an area that has never had um, crop production, uh, make sure that you've really gone through and killed whatever was there um, beforehand because once you have Bermuda grass and um, some of these really irritating weeds like um, Virginia creeper, bindweed, they get up in the canopy and they're, they're really hard to deal with once they're established. Um, and then basically blueberries in those first five years of growth are, are not competitive with the weeds. I've seen grasses overtake, you know, blueberries. So you really have to be on top of it. Um, you can mulch, um, and that's what a lot of people do to kind of keep the weeds down. I also think that um, plastic mulches work really well, um, and that's, they do a lot more of that in the south. Um, and then I, I would always advise that you use a pine mulch, but I know a lot of people can get free, you know, mixed hardwood mulches, so that's what they end up using. Um, for anybody who's doing organic production, weeds are going to be an even bigger problem for you. So um, consider some of these, you know, strategies like um, living cover or, you know, going through, if weeds are getting really bad, coming through with a cultivator. Um, otherwise, I think it would be really worth it if I was going to produce organic blueberries. I would definitely weed mat, um, you know, on both sides or try containerized production. That's what they're doing um, in a lot of other parts of the world. California, they're doing a lot of containerized production. Florida's doing some. So, um, you know, if you don't have the right soil for blueberries and you're going to be putting all, dumping all of this amendment into it anyway, maybe it makes more sense to just fill a couple of containers um, and grow them that way. How many containers do they use? So, I was doing research in Florida and we had a couple different pot sizes and I think it was a 10 and a 15 gallon 
and there was no difference between the 10 and the 15 gallon in terms of productivity and yield. And I think there were, at least we knew about uh, other grow operations that were using even smaller size um, containers. But. And the containers, you're talking big containers because of the width, right? The width of the yeah. containers because the root systems are shallow. Right? Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I've been arguing with, you know, even in the nursery trade, it's like we're growing abrodies, we're growing azaleas, we're growing blueberries and stuff. Why is the demand for container manufacturers to, for more of the shallow? Wider. Wide shallow. Yeah, yeah. Can, and they're more stable, they don't blow over either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that was something, yeah. I mean, it's, I think it would be great if more researchers <laughs> um, yeah, so I haven't actually seen anybody do containerized production here in Maryland, but I'm sure it would work. And if you really have soils that don't lend themselves to growing blueberries, I think it would make a lot more sense. Um, so some of the cultivars that are at least recommended um, on the shore um, I've included here. This was uh, research that was done by the University of Delaware um, that they put out back in 2019. They had a variety trial that was established in um, Georgetown. And at least their recommendations were for Chandler, Legacy, Blue Crop, uh, Lenore, and Sweetheart. Um, they recommended with reservation uh, Rika, Blue Gold, Darrow, and Aurora and Jubilee. And then they don't recommend Toro, Liberty, Bonus, Star, um, Misty, Hannah's Choice, and Arlen. Um, I don't really know, you know, yet. Um, we put in a blueberry trial um, two years ago, so we just, we don't have any data um, here as to how these ones do, but we have a couple of different varieties that I'll go through um, that we have in our study. Most of these are considered um, northern high bush or mid chill. Um, if, if you're looking for a blueberry variety that makes sense, all the northern high bush are going to do fine here in Maryland. If you're looking at a southern, uh, a southern high bush or a mid chill, you just kind of want to check to see how many chilling hours it needs. If it's under 400 chilling hours, it's not going to make sense here. It's going to flower too early and it's going to freeze off. And a bunch of these cultivars that Delaware didn't recommend, Misty and Star, those were bred in Florida. So they may not really make sense here. I mean, it makes sense that they don't do well here and they get that late frost um, and all the flowers die. Um, but some of the mid-chill or North Carolina varieties may make sense here, even some of the Georgia ones, especially if for some reason you want to hit an early market window, if that's a competitive advantage for your operation. Um, there, I also have a list of varieties, if anybody is interested, um, from the breeder up at um, New Jersey uh, that works for USDA, Mark Ellenfeld. Um, and I would just take um, this information with a grain of salt because he's a breeder. Breeders all like their own stuff better than anybody else's stuff, right? So, um, uh, you know, some of these that he's picked out, you know, you got to just assume he likes his own. Um, but yeah, so we established a variety trial here at the Y and also um, in Salisbury. Um, and I want to thank the funders of this study who are um, the Maryland State Horticulture Society, and we're growing 14-some um, cultivars, and they are a mix of different um, chilling requirements. So some of these are um, kind of tried and true traditional varieties like Duke, um, Blue Crop, um, and, well, not top shelf. Um, but most of these are kind of newer varieties that I haven't really seen being grown here. Um, they all came from Fall Creek, which is a huge um, blueberry nursery out in Oregon that sells um, commercially. And some of these are supposed to have um, improved flavor qualities, which I think um, I'm really interested in. And I think if you're doing you pick operations or kind of direct sales, that makes sense for your bottom line to have some really interesting cultivars that people aren't going to be able to get in the stores, you know. 
um, pollination real quick. Um, hopefully if you already grow blueberries you know this, but um, they require cross-pollination so you got to have at least two varieties um, and preferably don't plant them in big blocks. You know, you want them to be close enough that the bees are going to be able to move between um, two bushes. And then the ideal pollinator for them is a bumblebee. Um, because bumblebees sonicate, so they kind of vibrate the flower. Um, honeybees will work. I mean, you'll be fine if you have enough honeybees um, in your blueberry, um, you know, block. But uh, bumblebees work better. So if you're if you're going to pick and choose, I would choose bumblebees. For blackberries, this is not important. They have an open flower, um, and they don't require cross pollination. Okay, let's see. How am I doing on time? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I will kind of try to speed through this and then if you have questions or you want any of this information, just let me know um, and I'll have my email at the end. But um, I'm really excited about blackberries because I think they're a heck of a lot easier to grow than blueberries, especially for um, someone who hasn't done small fruits before. Um, they also kind of need that high organic matter, like well-drained soils, but they're not as picky about pH and they require a more normal range. Um, 5.5 to 7, I think the ideal would be like 6.2. Um, blackberries, um, hopefully you know, they're very similar to raspberries, um, so a lot of the information and chemicals you can use in interchangeably because they're both ribus. Um, and they basically have a two-year life cycle uh, of a single cane. So the first year, that cane is the primocane. The second year, it's um, called the floricane. And that's um, the cane that bears fruit, um, except that now there are newer varieties uh, um, that will fruit on primocane. Um, and I'll talk, a, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, if you're planting blackberries for the first time, you can expect um, the longevity of that planting to be between 10 and 20 years. Um, again, uh, nitrogen for the first year is going to be uh, a little bit higher than blueberries um, because they are putting on more vegetative growth. Um, and then second year, 45 pounds. Third year, you get up to 60 pounds. The only reason you'd be applying a little more nitrogen the first year is if you have a primocane fruiting variety. Um, uh, same as blueberries, I would just have your leaf samples um, sent in. Um, you know, sometime in the summer to make sure that all the micronutrients are there that are supposed to be there. Um, in terms of trellising, so there are all these new varieties that say they have um, upright or erect um, plant structure. That does not mean that you don't need to trellis. You still have to trellis blackberries. Um, so I. I think when they have that big fruit load on them, um, you really want um, them supported. So you can use a V trellis, you can use a T trellis. Um, the most important thing about the trellis is that you know it's able to hold the weight of um, of the the plants that are going to be resting on it. Um, the spray schedule that I found that I like. Um, is actually from the Southeast Regional Caneberry Integrated Management. Um, I don't, I don't like this quite as well as the, the New Jersey um, blueberry guide, but this is pretty comprehensive. It's going to have all the products that are labeled um, for, for both blackberries and raspberries. Um, and it's a whole bunch of universities, um, including, you know, all, all the way up to Virginia. And I think our climate here is pretty similar. Uh, you know, technically we're the mid-Atlantic, but we have a lot of the same problems as the South. Um, so hopefully Kelly covered spotted wing drosophila. Um, I'm seeing this already a lot in blackberries and raspberries. It's a huge problem. Short generation times, you're going to have to spray a lot. Um, another problem that I've seen um, growers having is uh, the strawberry uh, clipper weevil. It's really tiny, um, but when you have it, it can really reduce your yield because it starts taking out flower buds. It lays its eggs um, in the flowers and then um, they eat the flower when the larvae hatch and then they go off and um, kill some more flower buds um, as larvae. So this is a bad one if you're seeing in your planting. And then I've seen um, quite a bit of this in my own plants and some other folks. Um, 
the redneck cane borer. I don't think I've actually seen the insect itself, but you see the damage that it leaves behind, which is a bulge um, in the cane. And then you can cut it open and see if it's hollowed out. And then you know you've got it. So is that half-ripe fruit? Is that a result of that pest? So that's just the picture. Oh, no. I, I just kind of put the blackberry picture in the blackberry section of the okay. talk in the blueberries okay. so we know where we're at. Okay. Yeah, no. No, it'll just start cutting off, you know, like the sugars to that area. Uh, um, but they, the canes don't totally die off, usually, with, with this pest. Um, okay, so these new cultivars, um, many of them have kind of improved plant structure. They're not these trailing, you know, viney um, varieties like Chester and Triple Crown were. Um, they're much more upright. They have, you know, thicker canes. Um, they're just hardy looking plants. And um, most of the cultivars I know of, well, the only cultivars I know of that are coming out for blackberries are coming out of Arkansas, um, North Carolina, and Oregon. Um, and traditionally, we haven't grown Oregon varieties here because they grow more for the processed market, and they were growing more of the, the trailing thorny varieties. But now they're starting to release thornless um, more using basically the East Coast germplasm to release new varieties too. So I'll, I'll talk about that at the very end. Um, in terms of should you plant a primocane fruiting variety versus just a, tr a, a floricane fruiting variety, my thoughts are I would not plant them, at least not for commercial production. Um, one, because all of these primocane fruiting varieties, um, you're basically going to lower your floricane yield for the next year um, if they have a pretty heavy primocane crop. And then additionally, you're going to have to be spraying and doing all the IPM that you do during the fruit season two times a year because you're going to have a floricane crop and a primocane crop. And things like spotted wing drosophila sort of compound and get worse um, throughout the season. So if you have fall fruit, I mean, it just, it's... I, I think you're going to sacrifice some of the quality. So I, I would prefer to plant only floricane fruiting varieties. Um, so we're going to have a fact sheet coming out here soon um, that includes all of these new blackberry varieties. But um, here's a glimpse of them. All of the cultivars that have um, Native American names, those are coming out of Arkansas. All the cultivars that have... Um, space names, those are coming from Oregon. Um, so basically in the purple color, um, I have the varieties that are supposed to have improved flavor. I know specifically Cotto and Ponca from University of Arkansas, I have planted um, at my home and they're supposed to have much higher bricks um, than some of these other varieties and improved, you know, aroma notes. Um, and then these three that just came out of Oregon, Galaxy, Eclipse, and Twilight, they're also supposed to have better flavor um, than kind of the early thornless blackberries did. And that, that was a complaint that people had about these early thornless varieties, that they tasted like garbage. Um, question? Does the sweet orchid, uh, Cato and Ponza, are they uh, primocane seed flat or are they fruit on them? No, the only primocane ones here um, are... Primarchs, yep. So Arkansas kind of helpfully does the trademark uh, of kind of that trait. So all their sweet lines are going to be called Sweet Arc, and then Primark are all their primocane fruiting ones. Yep. Um, and they have a pretty, pretty solid breeding program. Um, so we actually had a variety trial. It was not here. Um, it was in Upper Marlboro. And um, this data and the graph, um, and I think all of the harvesting was done by Alan Leslie. Um, and these are some of the varieties that I just talked about, but you'll note that all of these are not the better tasting varieties. Um, the, those are uh, newer, basically came out um, before the, after this study was started. Um, but you can see Osage, Owachita, and um, Vaughn basically consistently yielded better then a Pat or Arapaho, which is a much older Arkansas variety, and then Freedom is one of the Primark varieties. Um, they did not like it, and I think it also had pretty soft textured fruit, which 
you know, isn't really going to make sense unless you have a UPIC operation. Um, and then these graphs were just to show when the fruit um, comes on to the plants. Um, you can kind of see that, uh, is it, yeah, Osage more or less puts on fruit before any of these other cultivars. Um, and now I will say Osage is not my favorite tasting blackberry, but if you want to be early. Um, okay, so where do you get some of these plants? Because um, I think this is kind of an important question. Um, and how much are you going to pay for them? Uh, you can get blueberries as cheap as, I think, $1.25 at some of these nurseries, assuming you're buying, you know, in quantity. Um, blackberries you can get even a little bit cheaper. Um, and a lot of the, especially blackberries, a lot of those will be coming out of, like, you can get them um, tissue culture, so hopefully clean plants. Um, these nurseries that I have in black um, do blackberries and blueberries, and the ones that are only in blue only do blueberries. Um, and so this is just, um, hopefully, if you want this list of different nurseries, I'm happy to give it to you. Um, I have yet to find anybody that wholesales blackberries or blueberries um, in Maryland. So, I mean, you're pretty much going to have to ship them. Um, no matter who you buy from, unless you want to drive up to New Jersey and buy your plants. Um, yeah. And then um, the other tool that I like to use for any berries is the Mid-Atlantic um, Commercial Fruit Growers Guide. And I believe this is free. You can get it from Penn State if they don't still have it up. Um, I think I had to email Kathy Demchek, who's one of their um, extension agents. But um, you can at least get the PDF for free. So I use that a lot when I'm searching for trying to figure out um, like a, a specific pest that I'm looking up. Um, the fruit and vegetable convention that they're, they're gonna just about it. coming out with a new one. Yeah, that's right. Because I think this one, this version is from like 2013. Probably says here on the inside cover. Um, but yeah, I think they are working on a new one. Like, it's yeah. Soon, okay. Um, and that's kind of all I got. Um, if you guys have any questions or if you want any of the material, because a lot of this um, is an aggregation of um, basically information, you know, you can get from other places. But um, I can send it all to you if you take my email or give me a call. I'm happy to send you anything or come out and see your fields. Yeah.